Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, it's my pleasure. I'm going to see if I can pronounce this name correctly. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Paskov. He goes by Chris. Uh, <laughs> Did I say your last name right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Who's going to tell us about learning with n-grams today? Thank you. So uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to present today. It's an honor to be here. Um, as Adam mentioned, uh, I'd like to talk to you about my work on learning with n-grams. And this is joint work with my PhD advisors, Trevor Hastie and John Mitchell. Much of my work has... Uh, guided by this quest to develop a new kind of deep learning that I've lovingly started to call Dracula. It stands for uh, data representation and compression using linear programming approximations. And, <laughs> and to preempt the question, it is a backronym. <laughs> um, as the name suggests, this paradigm takes classical ideas from compression to not only learn efficient ways to store data, but actually to derive features that are directly useful for learning. And unlike conventional deep learning, which is this very non-convex optimi uh, optimization uh, criterion that's hard to really produce any theory for, Dracula can be expressed as a binary linear program. And so it has a lot of structure that we can leverage to make various computational and statistical statements about it. Now this journey to understand Dracula has led me down a number of interesting avenues, one of which was reading a book on suffix trees by Dan Gusfield. This is an amazing book. If you get the opportunity, I highly recommend it. Suffix trees are seldom seen in machine learning, um, it's with kind of the notable exception in the kernel trick setting, where uh, they're used to define pairwise similarities between documents. Other than that, it's really more of a bioinformatics thing. But in studying suffix trees, one of the things I noticed is that the bag of n-grams uh, matrix, one of the fundamental representations used in natural language processing actually has a lot of structure that's entirely encoded by the suffix tree of the text that you're using to represent. And so I used the structure to actually provide a fast multiplication algorithm for bag of n-gram matrices. And I'll briefly touch on how we can use this to gain some massive speed ups in learning with n-grams. The other direction that I've gone into heavily is optimization. And here I think that there's a lot of wonderful math that's currently being de developed, but also a lot of math that was developed in the 60s and 70s that's kind of being rediscovered and leading to a number of really fast algorithms for classical problems. An example of this is a very recent work of mine in which I uh, take duality theory and optimization in Hilbert spaces and use this to define a new learning paradigm that I call fine control kernels. Its goal is to lie somewhere in between the kernel trick and explicit representations. So, if you consider the kernel trick, really the whole point behind that is to store and manipulate a number of terms that's proportional to the number of training examples that you have. It's fairly independent of the number of features that you have. Can you say just the word what the kernel trick is? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, the kernel trick is kind of a, a dual representation for learning problems in which rather than uh, storing a feature matrix uh, for every, it, which, which encodes uh, values for every example and feature uh, pair that you might have. The kernel trick just stores an n by n matrix, n being the total number of training examples that you have, and it kind of implicitly encodes features. Now, in doing this, since we're manipulating and storing a number of terms that's only proportional to the number of training examples that you have, uh, you kind of, you know, that's, that's an advantage, but also a disadvantage. It's no longer compatible with a variety of regularizers such as the lasso, which induce sparsity and, and are very useful for producing interpretable models. Really, the lasso requires that ex, uh, explicit representation, but now you're stuck dealing with the number of terms that's proportional to the number of features that you have. And if you have many, many, many features, more than you can possibly store, uh, you'll run into trouble. So fine control kernels leverage this time-space trade-off in which we only ever store a number of terms that's proportional to the number of training examples that we have, but we compute but never store a number of terms that's proportional to the number of features that we have. And in doing this, the math kind of falls apart and it, it allows you to, to be compatible with uh, regularizers like the L1 regularizer that induce sparsity. Um, and it also leads to very fast algorithms. And so in this paper, I developed such an algorithm and um, uh, 
use it to, to provide a number of uh, computational guarantees on, on the actual learning problem. And so um, it kind of opens up a new, doors for what, a new door for what we can do with uh, many features. And most recently, uh, I've gotten into polyhedral combinatorics to try to understand the structure of Dracula. And we'll see what kind of work this leads to. Now, what connects all of these works is the fact that they focus heavily on learning with n-grams. And the reason I've spent so much time on this particular feature representation is exemplified by a paper uh, from a colleague of mine a few years ago in which he sought to simply establish baselines for a variety of natural language processing tasks in which he trained simple unigram and bigram models uh, to, to see how they compared against deep learning and a variety of other representations. And what was the huge result out of this paper was that these simple models actually won in almost every case or were at least competitive with state-of-the-art methods. So this is in comparison to a variety of deep learning methods, hand-tuned rule-based methods, and uh, methods specialized to um, NLP. Uh, I believe it was in the transactions of the, or in the ACL. If, if you look it up, it's called uh, Baselines and Bigrams. It's a great paper. Yes? When a bar is missing on your graph, does it mean the accuracy is so low that it's off the scale? Uh, it just means that it wasn't, uh, that a result wasn't available in, in the paper. Yeah. Can you give us some intuition? Though most people would find that surprising because they would have expected deep learning, right? Yeah. I think, um, I mean, was there less as much less data than there is available today? How much training you know, remember? So in general, these, these particular problems, uh, the largest one had about 50,000 training examples. So they weren't massive scale problems. But uh, yeah, so that, that might help explain part of that. Um, but I'll get to the large learning scenario in a second. Um, this effect is seen in other areas, too. For instance, um, there's a recent uh, paper on metagenomics in which the authors again take just a simple bag of n-grams representation and use this to get results that are comparable to methods that are much more finely tuned for problems in bioinformatics. And one of the interesting things that their, uh, their paper also shows is that for their particular problem, using longer n-grams helped performance substantially. And, but here they ran into some real computational issues. They, they heavily relied on the Vopal Webit and a large cluster of computers to train with up to 12 grams. And I would argue that you, know, you generally don't see such long n-gram models because of the computational burden that they place on learning. Um, in NLP, people rarely go beyond trigrams. Do you heard of gap gamers So very briefly, I've heard of gap gamers. Uh, we we're talking later, so I'll sure, yeah, that, kind of Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about those. Yeah. Or is it important that we look at these? Uh, it's, it's not too important, just beyond that they're uh, kind of more finely tuned methods for, for the bioinformatics problem. Um, so this computational burden, you know, people have argued that maybe longer n-grams don't really help uh, these NLP problems. But uh, in the paper with the fast multiplication algorithm, we actually trained on some massive data sets. So these were uh, beer reviews, so one and a half million beer reviews from the beer advocate data set. And, uh, you know, millions to tens of millions of reviews from Amazon.com. Um, and in this case, uh, it actually benefited. The more data we had, uh, the better we were able to leverage four and five grams. And so long n grams can help performance. Um, this kind of disputes that, that claim that short n grams are the only thing that's useful. And the key here was that our algorithm allowed us to train this model very efficiently, about as efficiently as we would have trained it with just using unigrams or bigrams. You want to say just like people in case they don't know what an n-gram is? Oh, that's, yeah, I'll, uh, okay. Okay. yeah, okay. yeah, I'll, uh, <coughs> so I'll very briefly introduce uh, this n-gram multiplication algorithm and, and show you its use case in machine learning. Okay. So, Suppose I give you a bunch of text reviews, uh, let's say of movies, and each of them is labeled with whether or not the reviewer liked uh, the particular movie. And I ask you to predict, based on the text of the review, um, the associated label. So one of the first things, first and most simple things that you can probably do is train a bag of n-grams model on this. So uh, what I mean is uh, the bag of n-grams matrix uh, is our feature representation that stores a row per review 
and a column for every n-gram. So an n-gram is just a substring that appears in any of your documents. Yeah, uh, uh, well, up to, up to, up to some, some maximum length that we'll, we'll allow. Um, and each entry in the matrix just counts the number of times that that n-gram or substring appears in that particular document. It's just the frequency count matrix. And what you'll probably do is then train some kind of supervised uh, learner with this. And the modern thing to do is pose this as an optimization problem in which uh, you learn some vector of coefficients that's somehow predictive of, of your target. If you look at what we're really doing at the core then, any optimization, virtually any optimization procedure is going to, uh, to to solve this, with the exception of cyclical coordinate descent, is really going to rely on matrix vector multiplication as its core operation to learn. Essentially, all these, op uh, all these optimization procedures like gradient descent, uh, quasi-Newton methods, even some of the more recent operator splitting methods, will just add various combinations of x or x transpose multiplied by a vector uh, until they converge. Yes? But any sampling method, like SGD, SVRG, Descent, like you said, all of those, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do that very infrequently. Yeah, right. so, so there are definitely classes of algorithms that, that don't rely on, on matrix multiplication quite, quite as directly or, or they use other means, but there is kind of a large class that, that, that do. When you say matrix multiplication, you mean matrix vector multiplication? Matrix vector multiplication, yes, matrix vector multiplication. That's, that's, uh, that's, what, I always refer, that's what I always mean in this context, okay. yeah. Does that time include, that, is that multiplication like a sparse multiplication? So did that mm -hmm. no, estimate include the fact that you can actually speed it up? Right? Yeah, yeah, so this, this is with sparse or, or dense, really, whatever is, is. Yeah, I actually wanted to have a, a cute graph here showing, you know, for various algorithms and uh, um, learning scenarios uh, what the timings were spent on multiplication, but it was generally always above 95%, so, you know, typically closer to 100%, so it was kind of boring, so. I just said it instead. Um, so with this in mind, let's, let's look at what the multiplication time for a bag of n grams matrix can be. Um, so if we define n to be the length of the corpus, so the total number of words in each of the documents, then there are examples for which it requires a quadratic number of uh, operations and, and also space uh, to do sparse multiplication with the bag of n grams matrix. And uh, by leveraging the suffix tree structure, what we realize is we can actually get this running time down to a linear uh, time. And I'm not going to get into the details of this algorithm because it, they're primarily just painful. But uh, we were actually able to come up with a custom tailored data structure that really only captures the necessary information uh, to perform this multiplication. And in fact, it provides a, yes? Constant in the big O of M depend on the <coughs> length of the yes. gram. Sorry, the n is being used in two, yeah, yeah. depending on whether it's capitalized or not. But for, for eight grams, would there be a constant in the big O depending on the number eight? Yeah, excellent question. So that's, that's basically how people battle this, uh, this quadratic time. Essentially, the running time is, uh, let's say, k times n, where k is the maximum n gram length. And so if you, if, to get this running time, you basically consider like the set of all n grams or, or something about as large. Uh, letters mean again here, the DK? So each of these are documents, okay. and so this is just the total uh, document length as measured in the number of words in it or whatever level of granularity you're operating at. So for, for <coughs> those of us who are not that familiar with suffix trees, mm -hmm. I understand you don't want to get into the details of the algorithm, but can you give us the core insight that allows this to be so sure. much more efficient? Well, so, uh, it turns out that basically the, um, there are two big components to this. The first is that bag of n-gram matrices typically contain a lot of redundant columns that we can get rid of. And the second is that Just once because you... Because the n-grams are sort of like personal overlap with each other? Um, it's because of kind of the, the theory behind suffix trees, but a lot of times you, you, you have to end up actually, it turns out, with, with these strings where uh, if you, you have a substring and then it's followed by a character and, and these always appear in the same location, so they have identical columns among your doc... Uh, identical frequencies among your documents. Uh, this is actually something that necessarily happens for any fixed corpus. Uh, the other big speed up is the fact that once you remove these redundant columns, you end up uh, exp expressing the matrix essentially as just a linear combination of, of 
columns um, corresponding to long n-grams based on the suffix tree itself. So all of this ends up being just uh, coefficient propagation up and down a tree. That's. Um, it, so the the recursiveness leverages the nestedness. the The redundancy is is just kind of a an interesting side effect of uh, in. Are you familiar with suffix trees? Okay, so you. I, I actually think it would be great if you could try to explain this stuff, assuming that none of us are familiar with suffix trees. I, I just think that there are sure. probably some people here who are. There are probably enough people who aren't that it would okay. be good if you could try to. Um, Okay, sure. Uh, essentially, imagine, yeah, uh, this is kind of only the, the, the teaser for this paper of the talk, but I'll, I'll explain that briefly. Um, so, let me, in essence, uh, imagine that I have the string x a, x a, you know, just I have this repeated. Then the way redundancy occurs in this case is um, if, if you look at every time I see x, um, I'm also going to see x a. So uh, at any given, uh, essentially these these always co-occur. And so among all of my documents, these would be um, these would have an identical distribution or identical columns, and and, and that, that's what leads to your uh, redundant columns and in, in gram matrices. It's actually something that if you remove these redundant columns, you generally end up with a better learning performance too in terms of accuracy. Um, the second uh, component of this is the fact that uh, is leverage is nestedness. So the fact that you know, um, if I you know, if in order to uh, to get the frequency counts for, well, let's let's move to a more complicated example. Um, suppose I now have x b x c x b x c. In this case, uh, to get the frequency counts for x, I could sum over all of the frequency counts for x b and x c. And that, that leads to this kind of nestedness and essentially this tree structure that we utilize to multiply. What is it that you're computing in time over, over n? Uh, any matrix vector product with, with, the, with any uh, bag of n-grams matrix. Uh, so it's for each document or for a single document you're getting this in? You're getting for all the documents? For all the documents, yeah. So, so you, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a fairly big speed improvement. Um, so the suffix tree, though, is kind of only conceptual in this work, and suffix trees themselves tend to have this uh, nasty constant overhead associated with them. Uh, but we actually came up with a customized data structure that allows you to efficiently store your data uh, in, in a persistent manner that's essentially just fine-tuned to learning with n-grams. And this data structure uh, does all kinds of pre-processing when given a new learning problem. It performs feature normalizations, uh, figures out which n-grams will be useful for the learning problem, and then outputs a custom bag of n-grams matrix. And what's kind of cool about this is this isn't just some kind of complexity result. It actually has real practical improvements, too. Um, so this, these are some memory benchmarks uh, for our multiplication routine. And the reason I don't have timing benchmarks here is they essentially follow the same pattern as memory. All of these multiplication routines are just a linear sweep through the memory. And the first is on natural language data. It's on the beer data set. And there are a variety of representations that I'm comparing against, that essentially they, they come from whether or not I've removed redundant columns and whether I leverage the fact that I'm dealing with frequencies so I can store integers rather than doubles. In all these cases, though, my representation is essentially close to independent of the maximum n-gram length that you use, uh, and it's far more efficient. It's about three to, time, three to five times faster than, uh, or three to five times uh, more memory efficient than the next best method. And that's what allowed us to, to train at such massive scales on just using actually a single core on my uh, home desktop computer to get the results for the earlier results I presented. The, the other improvement, the other data set that we looked at was uh, from SNP chip data. So here we had uh, data on about 200 people, uh, their chromosome one. And you can think of this as a binary string. And this data has a very different distribution than natural language would. And here we got some remarkable improvements. So as the n-gram length increases, we can, the suffix tree uh, multiplication algorithm can be thousands to tens of thousands of times more efficient than doing things naively. And n-gram models are, you know, cropping up in some areas of bioinformatics, but I would say that this doesn't just allow us to learn faster. This now opens up a new door for what we can do with n-grams. And I'd be very curious to investigate this further and uh, any collaborations that you might be interested in. 
So yes. So those top curves require a huge amount of universe. Yeah, yeah. Those, I mean, those these top curves are essentially Im impossible to represent. So how did you figure that out that it would require that? Much so, curve? for this, I actually just uh, you can use the suffix trees to calculate the number of entries, uh, the number of non-zero entries in the in the naive matrix, and then and then so do out the calculate how many gigabytes it would take without actually. Yeah, I mean, for for what I could, I actually constructed the matrix, and yeah. but you know everything lined up, so yeah, those are faithful. Yes. So your previous slide showed an n squared to n improvement, yes. which would be a factor like proportional to the size of the corpus. Mm -hmm. And your graphs seem to be showing the top one is like a tenfold improvement, the bottom mm -hmm. one goes up to maybe a thousandfold or so, yeah, maybe ten thousand. So it looks like the improvement factor is closer to the arity of the n-grams rather than the size of the entire corpus. Do you, first of all, is that a correct reading of the graphs? And secondly, do you have insight into why maybe the improvement factor is in that? Sure. Yeah, so excellent question. And that kind of depends on the on the structure of the data. So this, this quadratic improvement is, you know, four carefully chosen uh, counterexamples where suffix trees are great and, and but that have many distinct uh, n-grams. You're right in that it kind of seems to depend on, on some factor of the maximum n-gram length. And what that is is there's, there's typically a certain n-gram length at which you, you have a lot of distinct n-grams going on. Um, in, in natural language, it tends to be up to about 7 grams. And in this, NLP, in, in this uh, bio example, it was uh, closer to thousands or tens of thousands. Uh, after which, things kind of calm down, and, and the distinction between the tree um, and, and the naive method stops being as large. So it, essentially, most of the information is being captured by this, this initial set of, of n-grams, and, and that's where the speed improvement lies. The previous slide, was it, about, was it a time bound, or was that also a space bound? It, it was time and space, yeah. OK, so what I'd like to spend the rest of the time focusing on uh, is Dracula. So, I'd like to introduce you briefly to what this uh, new deep learning paradigm is and to give you a sense of some of the problem structure and theory that, that, that we can say about it. So um, first introduce the criterion and then um, show you its, uh, the structure of its solution surface and actually visualize it. Uh, this is kind of unpublished work, so it's, it's kind of exciting to, to get it out there for the first time. And I'll do this by means of showing you how to express Dracula as a binary linear program. Now, the reason I'm visualizing its solution surface is for anyone who's uh, played around with GLMNet, one of the things you get out of it are these uh, regularization paths that tell you how the, model's coefficient, uh, how the model coefficients change as a function of the regularization parameter. And in some sense, what we're going to do here is do the same, but for a more sophisticated uh, regularization path that involves many parameters. And finally, I'll uh, conclude with some experiments showcasing uh, its features. So suppose I give you some text and you want to compress it. Probably the simplest thing you can do is set up a shallow dictionary compression scheme in which you store a dictionary of plain text n-grams, or strings, as well as a pointer set indicating where you should paste copies of each of these n-grams so as to reconstruct the data losslessly. So here I'm assuming that everything is reconstructed perfectly under this representation. Mm. We can improve upon this substantially by making it deep. And this is motivated by a very simple example in which I have a string of the letter A replicated an exponential number of times. In this case, the, the best that the shallow compression can do is to store an exponentially long string in plain text and to use an exponential number of pointers. So the overall representation length is still exponential. That's somewhat unsatisfying. But imagine now that I have a scheme that's allowed to compress its own dictionary. So in particular, dictionary n-grams can be expressed as a sequence of characters and pointers. In this case, the dictionary strings uh, I'm going to create are kind of the sequence of strings that is exponentially increasing in size. But every time I double the string size, I only use two pointers. And what this results in is a total uh, linear number of pointers or a linear representation size. So an exponential improvement uh, over, the, over the shallow compression scheme. And that's exactly uh, the idea underlying Dracula. Dracula is, is this deep extension of the shallow compression scheme in which we allow it to compress its own dictionary. Uh, so in this example, we've gone from storing all, 
all these uh, engrams in plain text, it's actually noticing that XAB and XAC occur quite frequently in the corpus or in the, in the document, and they both share XA, so we can, we can simultaneously reduce the total number of pointers used to reconstruct the documents, but still keep a reasonably small dictionary. And you'll notice that this is also equivalent to a particular kind of directed acyclic graph. So we can use this notion to very precisely define the depth of our network and, and draw some parallels with deep learning networks. Now, the way we're going to use this to extract features for learning is very simple. We're going to create bag of n-grams features. And um, what's slightly different, though, is that we're going to, for a particular n-gram that appears in the dictionary, we're going to count the number of pointers that use that n-gram to reconstruct the original document. So this is different than the traditional bag of n-grams representation, which, for instance, for XA, would count all of its occurrences in this document, so that'd be five. In contrast, here we only have one pointer that uses XA at the very beginning of the string, and so it gets a count of one in the corresponding feature representation. And we have this, you know, this thus far just discusses the actual uh, documents. It says nothing about how we might take into account dictionary structure. Yes? goal is just to compress the document, or is it to compress all points, all n-grams in the document? Or so, sure, the, the, great question. The, the compression's point is to compress the documents, but the way it's, it's a dictionary-based compression scheme, so it's going to store a dictionary, and it's also going to compress that dictionary to, to gain further space savings. The reason XA only counts once is because XAB and XAC took care of the other occurrences. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we, you know, by, by constructing this representation, we're kind of forgetting about the strings that are used to construct those n-grams. And um, while I don't want to get into it too much, uh, we can actually compute the exact same feature representation for our dictionary n-grams. And we can then define a kind of diffusion process that results in a regularizer that takes dictionary structure into account. But what's kind of interesting, what was kind of an interesting uh, result from this work was that the way you construct your dictionary really only matters if you employ some form of regularization. In essence, its structure gets canceled out uh, much in the same way that an uh, unregularized uh, generalized linear model will cancel out uh, feature normalizations if you don't add any kind of regularization term. I'm just wondering if my intuition is off, but it seems like you might in many problem settings want to actually count each of those XAs even when they're followed by a B or C. So is this the fact that you don't, you're saying under some circumstances it's equivalent whether you do or whether you don't? Uh, I'm saying under some circumstances you, you may not want to. Um, but yeah. in some you may very well, like uh, when I'm thinking of biology problems I model, I, I would think that I would want them actually. Sure, yeah, and, uh, and uh, I'll kind of discuss the representations you can get with Dracula, but, but you can get these like redundant representations where, where you do count things multiple times. Um, yeah. I, I thought the I must be pretty lost, but I thought that the point was that you can not count those and then just when you learn X post, like that's, it's taken into account that they're included within the other, is that right? Or? So th that's, that's what taking into account the, the way the dictionary structure would do. So you, yeah. That's what I thought was, the, well, I don't know. Well, it's, 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 it's kind of one extension. So if you think about traditional deep learning stuff, uh, you, you typically will, take the, the top layer of, of the network that you learn and use the features from that, or you can try to take into account the, the whole network in a, in a more sophisticated manner. And this allows you to, to do that by the dictionary diffusion process, or you can just take into account the top layer corresponding to which pointers directly correspond, uh, directly reconstruct the dictionary so documents. That last example, just to understand. So, mm -hmm. so there's two problems. One is that you may or may not, you have to keep track of how many times XA occurs. And another one is that like AB, or not, sorry, yeah, BX, which occurs, so if you were interested in BX, mm -hmm. that's not even showing up at all. And yes, yeah, yeah. So you're going to somehow smartly learn the right compression yeah. based on whatever your, it's a supervised problem, you're placing whatever your classification is, you'll figure out what is the right compression yeah. to do for that. So that that's, yeah, that's, that, that's actually why I'm going to get into its solution surface, because you're going to want to fine tune your representation. Maybe you do want to take into account, you know, every instance that things occur. And so, you know, kind of one of the questions I'm going to look into is, well, what happens when we try to fine tune these representations, the things behave in a reasonable manner? So you dynamically learn the representation with the supervised labels, or you have like a pre-training phase and then you fine tune, or? So right now, for this work, it's, it's you just have some kind of hyperparameters that, that you might tune over a grid. Um, it turns with out. With the labels data or with the 
Um, so you would, I mean, the, the way I explored it here was just tuning the, the hyperparameters without the labeled data. And then this gives you a number of representations that you can choose from. And then you can do model selection once you have a supervised learning problem. Uh, it's, it's not. So this is an unsupervised problem, right? Yes, right now this is unsupervised, yeah. So and it actually turns out that there's very simple uh, extensions where you can kind of add a supervised term to this. And that's kind of a follow-on paper that I'm working on. You referred a couple times to the dictionary diffusion process. Yeah. Are you going to explain more about what that is? Um, I, I'm going to, it's not the folks of the talk. Yeah, so, so yeah, just, just okay. the, the, the interesting point about that was the way you reconstruct your dictionary really only matters if you employ regularization. So, so. Just a, like for unsupervised learning here, so if we mm -hmm. think of these as words, mm -hmm. then you'd be finding common phrases. So the good, the good way, a good dictionary would have phrases that are mm -hmm. natural language. Phrases, you wouldn't be breaking any of those phrases. <coughs> exactly, yeah. Hopefully, you're finding motifs. Yep, exactly. All right, so now that we have a sense of what the, um, the structure underlying Dracula a little bit, I can actually show you how to express this as a binary linear program. So let's go back to the shallow scheme. In this case, one of the first things I need to do is figure out which n-grams are present in my dictionary. And the way we're going to do that is consider some universe of all possible n-grams that we might include in the dictionary. And to each of these n-grams, we're going to associate an indicator variable telling us whether or not it's present in the final compression. The second part of this is to figure out the pointer set. And here again, essentially, we're going to consider some universe of all possible pointers. And to each of these potential pointers, we're going to associate another indicator variable telling us if it's in the compression. And uh, you know, this actually creates quite a few variables if you think about it, because we now have, uh, you know, for any particular n-gram that might appear uh, in, in the dictionary and for any particular document in our corpus, uh, we are going to look at all instances of that n-gram in the, in the document, and, and that's going to generate a set of pointers, and then we're going to iterate this process over everything. Sure, sure. So t is just uh, the variable I'm using to, to correspond to uh, uh, the n-grams in the dictionary. So you can think of t as directly representing a dictionary. So t sub s here is a particular n-gram, and t sub s is 1 if, uh, if, if that n-gram is in the dictionary. And p is just a, a pointer. You can think of a pointer as a triple specifying uh, the document that it, that it can be used in, the, the n-gram that it uses, and the particular location. The, the main takeaway of this, though, is that we're creating a lot of indicator variables corresponding to uh, potential dictionary terms and, and pointers using those dictionary terms. And with this, uh, we can now kind of define the, the basic building block of the compression scheme, which are these reconstruction modules. And what a reconstruction module does is it takes in a fixed dictionary, and uh, for a particular document, it tries to compress that uh, document optimally in terms of uh, using n-grams that are only present in the dictionary. And so what it assumes is that you're given some kind of cost vector that specifies the cost of using any particular uh, pointer. And why we may want to have different costs depending upon the pointers uh, is, 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 a, is something I'll get to in a few slides. Okay. Is this the aim goal here of prediction accuracy or it's compression? Like, what's the goal you're... So it, it's, it's a great question. It's, it's interesting because, you know, Classically, you kind of think of this as, as storing, as, as trying to minimize on-disk space, so performing compression. And that, that corresponds to a particular setting of the cost vector weights. But ultimately, since we're in a learning scenario, we're going to try to maximize uh, prediction performance. And it's, you know, another one of the questions that, I, that I've been trying to investigate is, well, when do learning representations align with actual cost-saving representations? So it's, it allows us to, to explore the learning domain, but kind of take some ideas from, from the compression domain. Uh, I guess there's start. a link between compression and regularization that would help you with compression. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're hoping that by doing some kind of common sense compression, we're essentially going to extract useful features. Yeah. So the, uh, we can then write this out as a binary linear program in which uh, the objective is simple. It's just if we include a pointer, we pay the price of including that pointer in, the, in our representation. And the two main constraints of this uh, binary linear program are, are a reconstruction constraint, which forces a lossless reconstruction of the original document. So every location must be accounted for in some manner. And the second constraint in blue 
uh, states that we may only use n-grams that are present in the dictionary. So if a pointer uses an n-gram that's not present in the dictionary, that pointer is disallowed. And of course, all of our variables are constrained to be binary. Now, if you look at these constraints, it turns out that they're totally unimodular. And so this problem actually already has a lot of structure to it uh, in that we can simply uh, cast it as a linear program, and it will always give us a binary solution. So this problem is actually easy to solve. And in fact, uh, it's equivalent to a particular kind of network flow problem that has me wondering if a classical computer is actually the best way to solve this. Um, I'll leave that at that. And with this, we can now define uh, the I'm not sure yet. Uh, and more, I've been looking at analog circuits for um, this. This is just one one kind of fanciful thing I've I've, I've just taken a look at. But th you can set up uh, analog circuits for uh, flow problems, and so sometimes these things can be like millions of times faster in in, in practice. So, you know, I'd, I'd be curious where where that leads to. Uh, I it's it's kind of a it's a form, it's a kind of trellis with 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 backwards uh, with with units with ed, with backwards edges as well. But I'll, I'll I can oh it's uh, like a trellis. Trellis. Yeah, um, it's it's a particular kind of uh, directed network corresponding to to what's present in your uh, document. But I'll I'll take that one offline if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so the way we get to finding an optimal uh, shallow compression scheme, and we call this compressive feature learning in our first paper, is by jointly learning over what's present in the dictionary. And so here, this, this variable t, we're now learning over that as well. And we simply uh, share this dictionary among all of the reconstruction modules for all of our documents. That's, that's what this first term uh, represents. And the second term represents the cost of, if we include a particular n-gram in the dictionary, since we have to store it in plain text, uh, we have to pay that price, kind of that one-time uh, cost of storing it. And when we learn uh, over the dictionary and pointers jointly, this problem becomes NP-complete. So, you know, that's kind of a bummer because the original problem was so, of reconstructing was so easy. But there's a lot of structure there that we can leverage and actually use this to construct a number of uh, fast homotopic algorithms that give approximate binary solutions. And in particular, it also gives us a really easy way to take any continuous solution and round it to an explicit binary solution. So we can extend the shallow scheme to become deep uh, in a very simple manner. Essentially, we think of dictionary n-grams as these conditional documents that only need to be reconstructed if they're present in the dictionary. And so we preserve the binary linear programming structure of the problem. And Dracula's objective uh, is expressed by simply replacing that term on the right uh, with a more sophisticated uh, reconstruction cost for how much does this n-gram uh, require to reconstruct uh, given my dictionary, essentially. Are you trying to learn uh, some, represent some representation of this mm -hmm. unlabeled data? Yes. And it looks pretty different than a typical deep network, like than a neural network. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really based on fundamentally you know, different. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm calling it deep because we, we move from this you know, shallow scheme yeah. to, okay. to having multiple layers. Uh, all right, so, well, actually, one of the things that, we, that you've noticed now is I've introduced even more uh, cost terms into here. So we, we now have to specify costs for um, the pointers used in documents and, pointer, and costs for the pointers used to reconstruct the dictionary. And so what I'd like to characterize a little bit is the solution surface of this problem. And if, if, if you can imagine in, in the learning setting now, Maybe I've gotten some kind of compressed representation, but I'm given a learning problem. And so I'd like to fine tune that representation. What I mean by that is I'd like to wiggle my cost parameters a little bit to see if I can get in some representation that maybe employs more redundancy if it's necessary or less redundancy that ultimately provides better features for the learning problem. Just to mm -hmm. back up a second. So the, the goal here is you're given, let's say just you had a collection of peer reviews. Is that right, for example? Yeah. You have a bunch of peer reviews. Your goal is to come up with a representation of these reviews. Yes. Which you can then use to do what? Which you then use to extract features in this bag of n-grams manner, and then use that downstream in some kind of learning problem. Better features than you would typically get? Or is it more succinct? What is, it, what is the goal of this? Uh, hopefully, better features. 
Yeah, at a minimum, you know, it, it can kind of serve both purposes. Uh, sometimes you can use this to speed up training time by selecting uh, only a, a corpus of documents come yes. up with really good features. Yes, and then, yeah, for, for supervised learning. So, um, yeah, so this, so I've defined, as I mentioned, a lot of different costs here. And let's, let's kind of simplify things down to a common sense cost scheme. So we'll assume that all, all pointers used to reconstruct documents uniformly have the same cost. All pointers used to reconstruct dictionary engrams also uniformly have the same cost, except for unigrams uh, used in the dictionary. So unigrams now play the role of characters that are these somehow atomic elements that are, that are special. And so we may want to allow them to be discounted. Essentially, we say, well, you can, you can uh, write this n-gram as a sequence of characters that are cheap, or you can replace some subset of it with, um, with pointers from, from lower order n-grams. And these parameters actually give us, have a very interpretable effect on the dictionary and resulting representation. So the increasing the dictionary uh, pointer cost to, uh, net increases the cost of, of any particular uh, dictionary. And so it's going to favor dictionaries with smaller terms in them, essentially simpler dictionaries. It, it plays this quasi L0 regularization role in, in the problem. But one of the subtle effects that it adds is this kind of grouping effect in that because I can leverage existing n-gram terms, I'm going to prefer to include uh, n-grams in the dictionary that, that can be expressed as, as a combination of n-grams that are already present. So in, in the example, I had XAB and XAC both in the dictionary. Well, they both share XA. So I'm, I'm likely to, to once I have XA in the, in the dictionary, I'm likely to include either one uh, because they're simple to reconstruct. The other parameter, Alpha, which is the character cost, simply modulates the dictionary depth. So as alpha gets small relative to the cost of any pointer, it becomes cheaper just to store that n-gram in plain text rather than reconstruct it using pointers. And so it directly shrinks the depth of the dictionary. And if you tune these parameters, you actually can get a variety of representations. So uh, one of these is if you set everything to be negative, you get this maximally redundant representation that you know, tries to waste as much space as possible. But in doing so, it includes every pointer, every n-gram. And you, if you then carry out the bag of n-grams uh, feature extraction procedure, you end up with the traditional bag of n-grams. So in particular, uh, your, your question earlier that uh, uh, maybe I want to, to use replicated copies of, or maybe I want to count every time that XA occurs, you could do that essentially by setting the document reconstruction, uh, the document pointer cost to be negative. It would, it would, it would do that automatically. But it wouldn't do it differentially for different like, particular lengths Grams, right? Like, say you only wanted the XAs, but you didn't care. Like, you couldn't sort of differentially get this property. Sure, that's that is true. But you know, you, you could then move to a, a more uh, fine-tuned uh, cost scheme to, to allow that capability. If this isn't the case, then this algorithm of interest, right? The negatives, you could just use a different algorithm. Yeah, I mean, it would be a little bit of a waste to, to use them, but it's it's just interesting that this is a valid solution to our problem. Um, we can also get a completely shallow representation if we just set the pointer cost, uh, the, the, yeah, the pointer cost to be very high relative to the character cost. But in general, the kinds of costs I'm going to be interested in this particular context are ones that correspond to some notion of true compression and that they save on disk space. And this is attained by setting all these constants to be non-negative. So in light of the earlier question I posed, what happens when uh, these parameters vary slightly as, as a function of t that we're, let's say, we're trying to fine tune each of these costs to the particular learning problem at hand. So we're going to generate a variety of feature representations and see which of these provides the best features for a learning problem by varying uh, this parameter t. In order to, to understand uh, how the solutions vary, we're first going to look at the continuous relaxation of our problem. So this is formed by requiring that all variables be between 0 and 1 and are no longer binary. In this case, I end up with a simple linear program uh, whose constraint polyhedron uh, includes a variety of, of uh, nonsensical sol fractional solutions. But what's interesting here is that if you can, obviously this, uh, the set of all, Dracula, of all binary Dracula solutions is valid for this relaxed form. And since everything is constrained to be between 0 and 1, they actually are vertices on this uh, relaxed polyhedron. And so if we take these vertices and take their convex hull, we end up with another polyhedron that uh, has only binary vertices. And this corresponds to a polyhedron for the original Dracula problem. In essence, 
we can view Dracula as a linear program over a sufficiently constrained polyhedron that only has binary vertices. Now, unless p equals np, or you know, in, in general, this might be difficult to express algebraically, but uh, it is a polyhedron nonetheless. And in fact, the uh, schwatal gomery theorem shows us that we can take uh, this, this polyhedron, uh, the, the continuous relaxation with many spurious vertices, and prune it down via, uh, by adding a, a sequence of linear inequalities to the, to the system that essentially cut away useless vertices until we get the final uh, binary polyhedron. And I was able to use uh, some theory from suffix trees to define a, a series of cuts uh, that get you at least part of the way there. With this now, we can leverage uh, some machinery from linear programming. So uh, we can view Dracula or its continuous relaxation as a linear program and, and kind of use the same tools to, to answer questions for both regimes. And in particular, I proved the theorem in the paper that um, it's, it's proved in a much more general setting, but for our context, essentially tries to answer the question, what happens to the representations as we vary our cost parameters continuously? And I'll actually show you what happens. Yes. The dimensionality of this LP relaxation yes. is equal to the number of potential n-grams that can form. Uh, plus the number of potential pointers that you might have. Okay, so <clears throat> do you have experience actually solving this thing? And yes. Does one have to, I assume you have to apply some tricks in order to be able to solve such a high dimensional problem even in the fractional relaxation? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, that's. It's kind of why I've gone into optimization so much is there's a lot of problem structure there that, that you can use, uh, but you do need to use some tricks to, to handle everything correctly. And w one of these is moving into a dual space where you can kind of be independent of the number of pointers and just work with the length of the documents as an example. Okay. Yeah. So the upshot is after applying all the optimization tricks you found mm -hmm. for like eight grams on a corpus of English text. Yeah. This LP is actually it's, it's, it's tractable. Yeah, I, uh, the shallow version of the LP I, I solved uh, a few years ago um, on uh, on the beer review. So that was one and a half million reviews, and that was, in all honesty, me still kind of learning some tricks and optimization, so that algorithm can be improved on substantially. Um, so this is actually uh, for the first time ever uh, Dracula's actual. Uh, polyhedron corresponding to the text that I've that I've been using as, as an example through this presentation. Um, this is a kind of three-dimensional nonlinear projection of, of all of the vertices that we can reach uh, as optimal solutions of, of the cost scheme in which our parameters vary in this manner. And uh, its dual is shown up in the left there and the important part about that is that each of its uh, faces corresponds to a vertex on this original polyhedron. And assuming our cost functions never becomes identically zero, we can, without any loss of generality, just assume that our cost uh, function lives on the surface of this dual polyhedron. So the first part of the theorem states that as long as we remain on the interior of, of the face of this dual, then the vertex, the optimal solution remains the same. It's, it's just constant, and in this case, this is the actual solution corresponding to this somewhat deep uh, compression of the text. As soon as we move to another face of, of the polyhedron, the, the representation changes, and it's now constant as, as long as our cost vector lies on that other face. And so in this particular case, uh, we've moved to uh, this kind of completely shallow representation. So uh, thus far, I've shown you a scenario where we have this kind of piecewise constant uh, behavior of the solutions. And the way transitions occur is for that brief period when I am, uh, let's assume for simplicity that I get from one face to another only by crossing edges. This is actually fairly easy to enforce in practice. Um, for that brief instant when I lie on that edge, where my costs lie on that edge of the dual polyhedron, um, both solutions corresponding to, to both of the vertices here are, are, are valid solutions, and in fact, any convex combination of them is also valid. So, you know, we essentially we've got this piecewise constant behavior in which transitions occur with brief periods of, of non uniqueness of the solution. And what matters in our context is that what this states is if I'm at a particular vertex, if, if I only move along edges, the only other solutions that I can move to 
are ones that I'm directly connected to via an edge. So the solutions I can jump to by fine-tuning my costs are entirely dependent on the combinatorial structure of the polyhedron. And in particular, I'm not going to jump to arbitrary solutions that I'm not connected to. So for instance, this one back here corresponds to the maximally uh, redundant um, representation in which I include every single pointer. It's not possible if, I, if I'm moving on these two faces and I'm continuous to, to jump to this as a solution unless I go all the way to the back of the to the back of that polyhedron. So there is some nice predictability at least in what's going to happen. Okay, so I'll very quickly go through some experiments uh, uh, showing the efficacy of the features. Um, I'll skip the unsupervised experiments, but the, the point of this one is that the features actually can provide some interesting star plots of, of NLP data. Uh, this particular experiment uses uh, used the shallow compression scheme to extract um, features for uh, reviews written by about 10,000 authors on the Beer Advocate uh, data sets. So this was quite a few reviews, and, and there we were able to use the LP structure to, to train fairly quickly. Uh, this, this was running on just a single computer, and it took a couple of days to, to sweep over an entire uh, parameter grid. And uh, I used the resulting features in an author identification task in which, given a sample of each author's writing, uh, I had to predict uh, which, which author uh, wrote that particular sample. Problem? Yeah, it's 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 a little over ten thousand. So there's quite a few. Um, so accuracy ten percent is good. Yes, yes. It's it's the, the baseline of acting randomly is uh, is 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 quite low. And unigrams and trigrams uh, do reasonably well. But what was what was amazing was that we doubled accuracy using these compressed features for this problem. And this this curve on the left is a kind of it shows what happens as the as the character cost in the dictionary changes, and it's it's kind of implied by our LP theorem that that the performance sh that the representations shouldn't change too much from one from one uh, shift to another, but it's it's nice to see that in practice this is the case. So we get this very uh, nice uh, validation curve as a result. So that, that to me was you know it was, it was good that uh, we kind of had some common sense about this problem. So uh, the next experiment, and this is the final one I'll talk about, um, looked again at the author identification scenario. But here, to change things up, I took uh, 10 authors from, um, from the Reuters uh, data set. And I first parsed their, their writing into part of speech tags and then compressed those. So there was no notion of context anymore. It was just grammatical structure that we were trying to identify. And the goal of this experiment was to see, OK, we, we've seen a case where shallow compression can do better than n-grams. It seems to, to uh, than naive n-grams. It seems to identify particularly useful features. Does adding depth to the mix in a particular cost-saving scenario add, benefit us as well? And this is some small evidence that this may be the case. So as, as expected, the uh, shallow compression scheme does better than the all n-grams representation. Is CFL the same as deep lambda equals 1? Or? CFL is the same as uh, uh, is, 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 is the shallow scheme. So yeah, setting the character cost to be very cheap. Yeah. Um, but as the, as for various pointer costs, we actually saw an improvement uh, on the relative to the shallow scheme as well by going deep. And these results are kind of preliminary in that the deep version of uh, the Dracula, I, I'm, I'm still working out a, a fast algorithm to solve. I used Garobi actually to solve this. So it was even in this setting, Garobi managed to, I was impressed <laughs> with, with that I was able to solve it. But there are a lot of specialized algorithms we can build for the deep setting as well. And what I've shown you briefly is an introduction to, uh, to Dracula and, and briefly touched on some of the results of, of our fast uh, and gram multiplication paper. Um, going forward, one of the most immediate things that I'm working on is a fast algorithm to solve Dracula that really leverages its structure. And my investigation into suffix trees and duality was, was no coincidence. Both of these are major components of, of an algorithm I'm currently developing that allows it to scale to truly massive dimensions. Um, another active avenue of research for me is is into structured matrix multiplication. I, I believe that there may be a surprising number of feature, of kind of traditional feature representations in machine learning that have structure we can leverage to multiply quickly and expedite learning. And I'm actively looking for these. Um, I'm currently in the process of publishing an algorithm for fast uh, multiplication with a binarized bag of n-grams in which non-zero entries are simply replaced by one. Uh, 
longer term, what I'm very focused on is moving into the continuous uh, data realm. There, I think Dracula will, will truly be able to shine and kind of I'd like to put it up against some of these more traditional deep learning networks to see where it stands on those problems. Uh, now, continuous data is, is going to pose a whole new set of problems because in text, uh, we get away with suffix trees because an A is just as dissimilar to a B as it is to a C. With continuous data, you have to use things like error tolerance and invariance to draw connections between samples. And I'm excited to see what kind of algorithmic challenges this, this brings and how I can solve them. Uh, I'm also interested in massive scale optimization problems. So if you have hard problems that you're struggling to solve, um, come talk to me. I'd love to see if I can apply some of my knowledge to solve them. And if not, I, I'd love to learn new optimization theory to figure out how to do it. And finally, when I think about some of the most important structured data sets that we have out there, I immediately think to bioinformatics, things like DNA reads and, and protein sequences. And so I'm very curious to see how my existing set of algorithms uh, can benefit this, this data. But I'm also eager to see what kind of uh, specific problems come from this data and, and how I might use this to, to further develop my algorithms. So thank you. <laughs>